education. So tonight, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us in the first of our three-part uh, lecture series, Revolutionary Harbor, the Transatlantic World of Peter Fanman. In October of 2020, the National Parks of Boston, uh, the Museum of African American History, the City of Boston, and the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project installed a marker at the end of Long Wharf, recognizing Boston's participation in the transatlantic slave trade in the city as a point of entry for enslaved Africans. This marker is a major milestone in a years long effort that began with the Middle Passage Ceremony of Remembrance at Faneuil Hall. The goal of the ceremony and the marker is to honor those who were lost, those who endured the Middle Passage, and those who helped build the Americas, and to create an awareness and an understanding of the central role that slavery played here in Boston. In 1638, according to an entry in Governor John Winthrop's diary, the ship Desire landed with cotton, tobacco, salt, and enslaved Africans. These enslaved Africans were traded for captive Pequots from New England. This is considered the first documented evidence of enslaved Africans being brought to Boston and signifies the beginning of a roughly 150 year period in which the enslavement of Africans existed in Massachusetts. While slavery was not as widespread in Boston as it was in the Southern colonies in the West Indies, it does not lessen the impact of this horrific institution, nor does it diminish the complicity of Boston's elite in greatly profiting from human enslavement. The economy of colonial New England relied heavily on trade in the Atlantic world. Local merchants created vast amounts of wealth by trafficking enslaved individuals and trading goods consumed and produced by enslaved labor. One of the wealthiest of these merchants who exploited this system was Peter Faneuil. While Faneuil cannot be characterized as a major slave trader, his participation in this system offers a window into the transatlantic economy of 18th century Boston and just how intimately connected slavery was to it. In an effort to better understand Faneuil's leading role in this transatlantic trade and how heavily intertwined and dependent upon slavery it was, National Parks of Boston staff have spent months poring through his invoice books, day books, and letter books to create a new digital hub on our website, which is the basis for our presentation tonight. So wanted to let everybody know that we will save questions until the end of the presentation, uh, but please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window throughout the presentation. You can also type them into the chat. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Eric. Thanks, Sean. All right, I'm just gonna get the sharing going. Is that working? Everyone see it? Excellent. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending. It's an uh, exciting opportunity to share our research this evening about Peter Fanel and the Atlantic empire that he inherited, built upon, and profited from. Uh, when we began the project of trying to better understand the history of Peter Fanel, uh, we're fortunate that some letters, invoices, uh, ledgers do survive, but it's, it's very limited. There's only two years of letters that survive. However, after looking at them, studying them, doing additional research, uh, we've been able to uncover a lot more about the, the complicated legacy of the man that also built the hall that still bears his name, Fanel Hall in downtown Boston. Now, it, it's been known for some time that Peter Fanel dealt in enslaved people. He purchased enslaved Africans. He dealt in goods that were grown, harvested, refined by enslaved labor. But the true extent had never really been fully studied. Uh, one letter that survives that has been often quoted is, is the letter that I've highlighted here. Uh, it was written in uh, 1738, actually, uh, but by today's reckoning, it's actually 1739 uh, when the new year was in late March then. Uh, but he writes a captain named Peter Buckley uh, and he's sending this ship to Antigua in the Caribbean. And, and 
he makes a request that uh, after selling some fish to a buyer in the Caribbean, uh, with the net proceeds of the same purchase for me for the use of my house as likely a straight Negro lad as possible, as possible you can, about the age of from 12 to 15 years, and to be done, one that has had the smallpox, who for being for my own service. Uh, this is the only surviving documented evidence of Peter Fannel personally buying another human being. And when we went to look through all the letters, it's the only one. But then when you look deeper, it shows how much this man knew the Atlantic world, how powerful he was, how much wealth and privilege he possessed. This man in 1739 was able to just write a captain and he knew exactly what he was looking for. He wanted a young boy who was enslaved of African descent to serve in his household or possibly in livery in his carriage. Uh, it's a status symbol for him to own another human being. He knows that he wants someone who's already had the smallpox. This is kind of an investment to him. He wants to get someone who will not die from the smallpox or the diseases. And, and common uh, belief at the time uh, favored the importing, forced importing of enslaved Afro Creoles from the Caribbean, uh, believing that because they might already know English or will be teachable, they would already be immune to local diseases. This would be a better investment for your household. Um, to know this, to be able to ask a captain to do this, to be able to build, uh, to, to be able to make this request, it signifies that this man knows what he's doing. He knows the goods of the Atlantic. And part of that list of goods are actual human beings. So this is how we kind of begin to explore the role of Peter Fannel, the legacy of Peter Fannel, and the people that were affected by him and his legacy, both good and bad. Now, we don't know exactly for certain if Captain Buckley fulfilled this request. If he did, he returns to Boston roughly in April of 1739. Now, Boston is the largest harbor at this time in North America. Boston has a population of over 16,000 people at the peak of Fannel's day in 1740. Uh, it is a major port that's a hub for trade, not just leaving New England, such as cod and timber, but it's also a major stop off point for uh, vessels that are trading up, up the coast. And it's kind of a last stop for goods, uh, for, for supplies, um, before you make the long plunge eastward to Europe. Now, if Buckley returned with an enslaved young boy at Peter Fannel's request, that ship likely landed somewhere on Long Wharf. And that's where the middle passage marker is today, appropriately to mark that this was not just a place of departure, but also landing. This boy would have lived at Peter Fannel's estate on Tremont Street. The workshop of Peter Fannel, or rather I should say the warehouse of Peter Fannel was down King Street near Long Wharf, roughly in this vicinity. For the rest of this enslaved young boy's life, if he did end up in Boston, he would have been right on the Atlantic waterfront, right on the edge of a world that had enslaved and captured him and that empowered a man named Peter Fannel to claim ownership of him. Now, how was Peter Fannel able to amass such wealth? Now, it helped that he had an inheritance from his uncle, Andrew. Uh, his uncle, Andrew, built the mansion in Boston, amassed a great deal of fortune, and uh, he never had any children. And Peter, being the favorite nephew, uh, ended up inheriting the vast majority of the wealth when uh, Andrew died just a few years prior to this letter uh, in 1737. Uh, but even, in, even before he inherits all this wealth, Peter Fannel, uh, he was essentially an associate with his uncle, learning the trade, learning contacts, learning what goods to buy where, to send where to make money. Now, the biggest market that they plied beyond just timber and shipbuilding, uh, buying ships for other buyers, whether they be in Jamaica or England, it's uh, salt cod. And while there was a lot of competition in Marblehead in Essex County, 
uh, Peter Fanel instead looked towards Nova Scotia uh, in Ile Royale, or today better known as Cape Breton Island. The fisheries to the north of New England uh, were, were just as rich as the fisheries off of New England. Uh, you had millions upon millions of codfish and fishermen caught them uh, by the thousands upon thousands of pounds. Now, uh, th this illustration is from a, a book, uh, it's basically called a treatise of, of fish, uh, but in French. Uh, and, it, and it illustrates the fishermen catching, landing the cod, cleaning it, uh, salting it, and then putting it on flakes to dry. Now, um, the salt cod had two distinct grades that men like Peter Fannel traded in. Um, there was the uh, marketable grade, and that would go east to Europe, particularly Southern Europe. But another grade called refuse or West Indies grade went south specifically to feed the hundreds of thousands of enslaved African people working in the sugarcane fields of the Caribbean. So when Peter Fannel sent ships to Nova Scotia and Cape Breton, for the most part, they're there to get cod. And that cod's either gonna go east for money or for credit, and it's gonna go south to the Caribbean to directly feed a, a massive enslaved labor force to offset the cost of then re-importing sugar and molasses. Um, now there's another interesting connection specifically for Fanel in this region, and that's the proximity of what was then French held Ile Royale or Cape Breton and British held Nova Scotia, formerly Acadia. Uh, after Queen Anne's War ending in 1713, Great Britain uh, claimed domain over Nova Scotia. And so it became a British held fishery. Specifically a harbor of Canso was a popular one uh, with men like Fanel. But because Fanel was a Frenchman by uh, ancestry, uh, his, his uncle and his father both were exiles who fled La Rochelle uh, in the late 1600s and they settled in New York and Boston. Uh, they maintain connections in the old country in France and uh, Louisbourg. If you actually sailed due east from Louisbourg and never wavered from your course, you would land directly at La Rochelle. And so historically for well over a hundred years, this settlement had a direct relationship with the mainland. Bringing in French goods to Lou Louisbourg from the east and bringing in molasses, sugar and rum from French Caribbean colonies from the south uh, Peter Fanel mastered the art of bringing French goods to Louisbourg and then very quietly moving them just south to Canso to uh, basically naturalize these goods as being British. Uh, there were tariffs on sugar, on molasses, uh, on basically on foreign Caribbean goods. And by slipping it through an otherwise sleepy fishing port where no one was paying attention, uh, Fanel was able to bring goods into British soil without paying tariffs. And then once it was clearly on British soil, it would then go to say Portsmouth or Boston uh, where the sugar was sold to the highest bidder and the molasses went to distillers to make more rum. All of these goods, again, came from the hands, the toil, the labor, the manufacture of enslaved people in the Caribbean. And so already his main business enterprise to make money, to offset his trade, to make more money, it is entangled with exploitation and enslavement. Now going across the ocean, we have uh, several major markets. And the first of which uh, would be what was often considered the mother nation. And that was England. Now for England, uh, for merchants like Peter Fannel, this was a net loss because it was England that you sent your money, your credit that you built up in other trade, essentially to be able to pay off your debts for imported manufactured goods from London. For example, in April 1739, he, wrote, he writes a uh, Mr. John Caswell, who was uh, uh, basically, he, he, he knows this man through a connection of his bankers in London, who he, reply, he relies upon heavily to maintain his finances. Uh, but he asked uh, in a letter, basically, could you dispose of or sell a dozen silver uh, knives and four candles? So clearly something that's too old, he's not, he's not fond of anymore. Um, and essentially sell them, quote, for my best advantage and procure for me a new uh, chagrin case, a leather case with a dozen new knives and forks of a handsome silver handle 
and the best blades you can get made in London. For my own use, with room in the case for a dozen spoons, the same size and fashion. So in 1739, he's taking the proceeds of whatever fish, molasses, sugar, even enslaved Africans by this point. He's taking that money and buying uh, whatever finery he can get his hands on to make his life even that much more comfortable in his house at the uh, edge of Beacon Hill in Boston. Uh, to this day, there are a number of fine pieces of woodwork and um, silver uh, tankards that still survive that were Fanel family heirlooms. Uh, one of the uh, tables actually was a card table with custom embroidery and it had these turret sides. Uh, it's unclear if it was made in England or by a New England craftsman, uh, but it was made of mahogany and it was incredibly expensive. And this is how Fanel uh, showed his success and his wealth. But to pay off these debts, to have enough credit, to keep this lifestyle afloat of importing such extravagant goods from England, it required other markets. Now, Northern Europe, not really a market for him to sell to, but was another place to buy from. Wines from France, manufactured goods from uh, German manufactories further inland up the Rhine and the Elbe River, uh, Rotterdam. Have pictured here down below, uh, he still had relatives living there. Uh, despite the exile of many Huguenots or French Protestants when Catholicism was no longer tolerated in France following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, uh, a number of uh, Protestants stayed in La Rochelle, including one of Peter Fanel's uncles. Uh, and uh, Peter Fanel's brother Benjamin would take a trip in 1738 back to England and France to settle family affairs, business affairs, uh, but also squabble with their uncle about uh, an inheritance of a recently deceased relative. Um, Europe and England, they were considering themselves the center of their respective empires. Uh, the economic theory of the day, whether it was France or England or the Netherlands for that matter, uh, it was very much about mercantilism. The colonies sent raw goods to the mother nation for the benefit of manufactured industry and ultimate export of those manufactured goods out and abroad. And so the whole concept was to protect British manufacturers or in the case of France, protect French manufacturers and French brandy distil distillers. For a merchant like Fanel, this meant hurting his bottom line because protections meant protected, uh, protected prices, tariffs. Uh, and so when he was able, Fanel typically would trade, you know, maybe through a friend of a friend, a contact of a contact to go through Hamburg to get manufactured goods. Uh, through the Dutch East India Company, you could access goods coming from China and India, perhaps at a cheaper price than you would with the English uh, uh, East India Company, because they enjoyed a monopoly and with tariffs on, say, um, um, tea uh, and other imports like spices. If you could play the market to your advantage and avoid any taxation, it helped your bottom line. But it's Southern Europe where he really makes his money. This is the main landing point for salt cod coming from Nova Scotia and New England. It's so important that some of these towns uh, like Cadiz, uh, which was kind of an entry point for further inland um, uh, uh, cities like Madrid, they're receiving some 12 million pounds of salt cod a year by the 1770s. Uh, and the reason why the 1770s are so astronomical is because men like Fanel built up that market supply and demand in the 1730s and 40s. Um, Fanel worked through merchants and most of his correspondence is coordinating with people like Landon Smethurst in England, Miguel Pacheo da Silva, who's actually in London, but he has connections in Spain and Portugal. Uh, several other uh, men like uh, Mr. Uh, Lori and Mitchell working out of Spain. He has these agents where he's constantly writing letters and working on trying to coordinate where it takes weeks to travel. Uh, ships going from Nova Scotia, picking up salt cod. Uh, a ship alone could carry over 225,000 pounds of salt cod. Uh, carry it eastward to say uh, Bilbao or Cadiz or uh, Barcelona. 
sell that cod to an agent who then would sell it to local merchants, shopkeepers, re-export it to other markets where it might fetch a better price. Peter Fannel sold essentially to middlemen who then sold locally. Uh, a lot of times he would get, if not straight up money, salt, which would be re which we brought back to Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island to make more salt cod. This was a critical uh, mineral that was needed for business. Wine, citrus fruit, uh, Fennel also enjoyed sweet meats, basically uh, sugary confectionaries and other high-end goods. Uh, he also dabbled in Florence oil or olive oil coming from this region. Um, but he also relied on credit. By selling goods to one agent uh, on the account of another, he could gain credit with, say, Lane and Smethurst in, in, in London uh, to offset more imported manufactured goods, either for resale on his account or for his own personal use. But something happens in 1739. Uh, tensions were building between Catholic Spain and Protestant England. Uh, and actually there was an incident and it happened several years prior to 1739 where a, a Spanish customs official got in an argument with an Englishman uh, and actually cut off his ear. His name was Jenkins. Um, and after a few years of saber rattling and uh, some di diplomatic intrigue, Ultimately, England and Spain begin to declare war upon each other in 1739, and it's called the War of Jenkins and Zier, uh, and it ends up rolling into a larger conflict known as the War of Austrian Succession by the 1740s. This is disaster for Peter Fanel, though. His biggest buyer of salt cod coming from Nova Scotia is Spain, now the enemy. And in this letter, Already there's rumblings of war by July of 1738. And he actually writes to his contacts in London that if there's some way that if war is declared, could I get a pass for uh, one of my ships in particular to still land in Spain? If I can't divert the shipment to Lisbon in Portugal to try to sell anything at the best advantage so he doesn't lose the cargo. This war disrupts Peter Fanel's uh, business routine. The fish for gold, fish for wine, fish for credit, but also fish for sugar, molasses, rum. It's disrupted by war. And when we looked at the documents, looked at his connections, dug deeper, we realized that he begins to shift to direct human enslavement, importing Africans from Africa beginning in 1739 and 40. And it appears to be a direct response to the fact that he cannot rely on the Spanish market as solidly. Now, before we arrive to Africa, there's one other market that's very, very lucrative for Peter Fanel. And that would be the wine islands, specifically Madeira and the Canaries. Uh, now these islands, uh, they had a warmer climate than mainland uh, Europe. Initially, they began to experiment with sugarcane, which is a, a plant native to India and Southeast Asia. Uh, but ultimately, because it's on the way from Spain, from France, from England, to either go westward to the Caribbean or southward and then eastward to the Far East, uh, the islands specialize in making wine mostly to supply ships. Uh, so that way you had a water that was less likely to spoil after weeks at sea because the alcohol kept the bacteria at bay. Um, now, eventually it was discovered that this uh, wine would spoil after some time. And so the winemakers, particularly on the island of Madeira, uh, specialized in fortifying these wines with uh, distilled alcohol like brandy. Uh, this fortified wine, after aging for months in a hot, hot ship, actually made it taste better. And so uh, colonists in, in North America in particular fell in love with Madeira. Uh, Madeira, about 25% of all Madeira exports ultimately went uh, to uh, the, the British American colonies in the later 1700s. And Peter Fannel was no exception. Uh, this letter that survives from 1737 uh, specifically asked uh, for, uh, in addition to his existing order uh, from his contacts in Tenerife Can in the Canaries, 30 additional pipes of a good Malmsey or a variety of Madeira wine. Um, now, a, a pipe, if I remember correctly, 
it's about 63 gallons and he's ordering 30 of them. Uh, and so he also comments that currently there's no good uh, Madeira to have and that whatever he could get his hands on would be welcome, not just by himself, but also by his uh, fellow shopkeepers uh, and coffee house owners, essentially, who would be happy to buy from him at, at his, you know, customary markup. Um, and again, when war breaks out, he can't trade essentially with the Canaries. He has to trade with uh, the Portuguese and Madeira, and it disrupts his uh, normal business routine. And so that leads us to West Africa. Now, again, no letter survives from Peter Fanel prior to 1737. We have spotty uh, invoice records and accounting records throughout the 1720s, early 1730s. There's no mention of any contacts of his directly going to Africa. And then something changed in 1739. Now, he had a brother-in-law named John Cutler. Uh, uh, Mary Cutler married his brother, Benjamin Fannel. Um, and John Cutler appears in shipping records heading east to Africa in 1739, 1740, 1741, and 1742. His first voyage, we're not entirely sure what happens. It just says he's heading to Africa. Um, we can't find any sign of his arrival back to any port. It could have been the Caribbean. It could have been South Carolina. We don't know. And then another voyage in 1740 went to Sierra Leone, uh, purchased or bartered for at least 70 enslaved, kidnapped Africans, and arrived in Williamsburg, Virginia. There, those enslaved people were sold for grain, for uh, corn, wheat, as well as uh, hogsheads of salt pork and beef, and eventually sold right up here to Madeira. Because again, the Canaries are off limits during the war. Now, the landing of this ship, it's named the Mary Ann. And the Mary Ann is listed as having an owner of uh, Joshua Bhutan and company. So Peter Fannel is not named, but Joshua Bhutan is an associate of Peter Fannel throughout the 1730s and 40s. Joshua Bhutan actually sails ships specifically built for him by Peter Fannel. And I'm very, very, uh, I'm willing to make an assumption that Joshua Bhutan and company likely included Peter Fannel, or at the very least, the ship, if not the cargo of human beings, was owned in part by Peter Fannel because Marianne was the name of his other sister. Captain by his brother-in-law, named, named after his sister, his youngest sister. It's a lot of coincidences there. There's another voyage in 1741, and then one more on a new ship, the Jolly Bachelor, in 1742 into 1743. After landing in the mouth of the Sierra Leone River, it's there that John Cutler and his crew, they end up purchasing or bartering over 80 enslaved Africans uh, in the Sierra Leone River. And then some Portuguese speaking Africans, essentially pirates attack the ship. Uh, and when Peter Fannel actually died in March of 1743, little did anyone know, but at the same time, his ship, the Jolly Bachelor, which we know for a fact he owned, uh, was completely stripped of its rigging, floating derelict in the Sierra Leone Bay and his brother-in-law was now dead at the bottom of the Sierra Leone River. Uh, some other white slavers from, uh, of English descent on the Banana Islands here, um, they got word of this derelict ship and they decided to rescue it. And they were able to recover most of the ship's rigging and um, at least 34 of the original 80 enslaved Africans that comprised the cargo. Uh, two died. 20, uh, uh, two died, a number of others were sold to basically buy the, the provisions and the other rigging needed to get the ship seaworthy to sail back to the Americas. And the last 20 were sold at auction in Newport, Rhode Island. By this point, Peter Fennell had died and so had John Cutler. 
And the men that enjoy that that receive uh, the estate, the next of kin, Benjamin Fannel, Peter Fannel's brother, John Cutler's brother-in-law, and John Jones, who by this point was now married to Marianne Fannel, and so a uh, a, a a posthumous brother-in-law. This means that by the 1740, early 1740s, just before Fanel died, he has a direct role in the forced kidnapping, migration, and sale of enslaved Africans, numbering at least 150. Now, there are slavers that are sailing from Bristol, England, to Sierra Leone, to the Caribbean, who are bringing over hundreds of enslaved Africans at a time. Nonetheless, this is still enslavement. This is still kidnapping. And this man made money directly from this trade. It was more than just a single straight likely Negro lad that he saw it for his own enjoyment at his house in Boston, but dozens upon dozens of people for the benefit of his brother-in-law, his family, his empire, his own selfish interests and demand for more gain. So these are some of the more direct comparisons we've been able to draw. And I, I truly believe it happened in part because his desire to keep making money led him towards slaving when, uh, when, when uh, fish sales uh, were, were stagnant in Spain because of war. Crossing the Atlantic through the Middle Passage, we arrive in the Caribbean. Now the Caribbean uh, essentially becomes all seized lands by European powers, largely French, British, uh, uh, Dutch uh, colonists. These lands are seized. These lands are turned into, ultimately by the late 1600s, massive sugar producing factories. To fill the ga labor gap, enslaved Africans became the sole method of growing, harvesting, refining, manufacturing sugarcane, sugar, molasses, and rum. Even before Peter Fannel became a man directly involved in the Middle Passage, directly involved in forcibly importing enslaved Africans, his uncle Andrew and he himself relied heavily on the trade between North America and the Caribbean. The Caribbean grew solely sugar, also indigo, generally cash crops. Every inch of arable land was devoted to the production of cash crops. They did not grow their own food. There was some local uh, fishing, fish catching. There were some local gardens, but for the most part, grain, protein, it had to be imported. And so long before Fanel was directly we have documentation for involved in the Middle Passage. He more than happily connects ships from Nova Scotia carrying refuse salt cod, ships from New York, Philadelphia, Virginia, the Carolinas bringing corn, rice, wheat, potatoes, beef, pork, southward to feed the Caribbean. This trade offset everything he had uh, it offset what he wanted to buy, sugar, molasses, rum. Peter Fannel, because of his connections, relied on not just British islands like Jamaica, Barbados, Montserrat. He also traded, in fact, probably more heavily, but it's harder to trace because it skirts international laws. There's limited documentation from the government. He trades with Saint-Domingue or modern day Haiti. He trades with Guadeloupe, um, Martinique, and uh, St. Lucia. These colonies, um, he has connections because of his French background, because he has connections in mainland France, Ile Royale or Cape Breton to the north, and connections to the islands here. He really corners the market in connecting cod, timber, and grain for slave grown sugar, molasses, and rum. He also engages up and down the coast with whatever would give him an advantage. And so even beyond the Caribbean, 
he trades with places like the South, uh, South Carolina for rice and indigo. And we have again, at least one confirmed voyage where the Marianne traveling up the James River lands near um, Williamsburg. And right here we have documented proof in the customs record simply listed as the cargo, 70 Negroes, 70 men, women, and children stripped from Africa and enslaved to work the wheat fields, the corn fields, or the tobacco fields of Virginia. In South Carolina, we also have some documented evidence of um, him building a new business relationship with a man named Robert Pringle. Uh, Pringle is introduced to Fanel by associates in London and essentially, um, Fanel is readying a ship to go from New England, presumably bringing timber, fish, down to South Carolina. And he uh, asked Pringle to send the ship to whatever advantage is good for him and Fanel to somewhere to the east, so long as it returned back to Nova Scotia in time for the fall catch. He also mentions that among all the rum he's shipping down from New England, the first two hogsheads are actually full of smuggled brandy. Don't tell anyone, and I hope you basically import it without any prejudice to my crew. This seems to be a normal course of business, and it also seemed to be a kind of way to test a new business associate. How savvy are you? How discreet can you be? Um, how much can you be trusted uh, to basically handle my affairs for me thousands of miles away removed? And if you help me, I'll help you be it rum, sugar, fish, or enslaved Africans. Even in the middle colonies, Peter Fanel has ties directly and indirectly to enslavement in this Atlantic empire that he builds. Now his father settled in New York. Um, specifically, New Rochelle is where they had a farm estate, but like most wealthy landowners in the Hudson River Valley, they had farms in the Hudson Valley and uh, merchant houses on Wall Street and right on the waterfront in Manhattan. Julian Verplanck was a trusted associate of the Fanel family. Peter Fanel essentially inherited this contact from his brother, from his father and his uncle. Julian Verplanck owned, again, an estate in the Hudson River Valley, had a trading house on Wall Street, and another close associate were the DePasters, similarly, uh, landholders growing wheat in the uh, Hudson River Valley and running merchant houses down uh, in Manhattan. Now, in New York, a lot of the labor for these wheat fields, it was supplied by enslaved labor. Uh, and in fact, uh, helping me in my research, uh, there is a historical society uh, devoted to uh, Van Cortlandt Park in the neighborhood there in the Bronx. Um, a family very similar to the Verplanks uh, in the DePasters, the Van Cortlands, uh, they had a large estate, they grew wheat, they grew other foodstuffs, and they relied on enslaved labor to sow, grow, harvest, and also in their own mill, a man that they identified later as Peter and his son, ran an actual mill to grind the wheat into flour for export. Uh, it's this connection uh, with the uh, Van Cortlands uh, it's illustrative of what happened all up and down between Albany, New York, down to the Bronx uh, in modern day New York City. Um, and Peter Fanel wrote regularly with Julian Verplanck, associates in Pennsylvania, to bring in wheat, corn, or in this case in 1738, 1739, old, uh, new style. Uh, you know, he, he mentions uh, uh, Julian Verplanck that uh, he would like 300 uh, bushels of buckwheat on the best terms and cash. Right, best terms you can. And at the best first opportunity, what quantity, uh, let me know essentially at the best opportunity, what quantity of Florence oil and Barcelona hand, uh, handkerchiefs I could send to you to resell. And so not only is he making an order for flour to come in, but he's also making an order uh, for Verplanck to buy manufactured goods from Europe to resell. He also mentions that before the weather gets hot, he'd like as much good Jersey flour um, as he can get. Northern New Jersey, the Hudson River Valley, these were vast wheat fields and slave labor was common. And one final connection we've been able to dig up 
uh, directly ties Fanel, Verplanck, and the de Pasters into yet another instance of a direct human enslavement. The letter books that survive are not in great condition. Um, and uh, we still, we, we have to give a really great thanks to the Baker Library at Harvard University for preserving them and digitizing them to this day um, to keep them going. Uh, but back in the 1800s, it appears some uh, papers fell out and were lost um, when they were um, in an archive. And one of the letters that were, was lost was a letter to Julien Verplanck uh, in 1739-40, where Peter Fanel asked Verplanck about, quote, an account of Negroes. Now, the only reason we know this is because a scholar in 1880 quoted this letter. And then after that uh, publication, the letter disappeared. And after doing some digging, we found that at Perth Amboy, New Jersey, just months after this request about an account of Negroes, a ship from Antigua by way of Cape Verde, West Africa, landed with 40 enslaved Africans. The ship was owned by Julian Verplanck and Abraham de Paster. It seems it's incredibly likely that this might be what he was referring to in this lost letter. Even if not, this is illustrative of this empire that Peter Fennell not only built, but thrived on and enjoyed lavish lifestyle at the expense of exploitation, and at the expense of seizing human beings and natural goods. 38 enslaved Africans were sold in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. The remaining two, it appears, were landed in New York City. And there, there was an actual slaving, uh, slave auction block. And it's entirely possible that that's where their fate lie. As we return, Back to the view of the entire Atlantic. I think back to where we started with this unknown boy, 12 to 15 years old. We still don't know if that request by Fanel was ever fulfilled, if he ever landed in Boston. But this boy's fate it was at the hands of people that had immense power. Peter Fanel is not the only one who had this power and who could command so much wealth and materials and human beings. But he's emblematic of this vast empire that stretched thousands of miles through letters, money, handshakes, and a willingness to stretch the rules, whether it was smuggling or to ignore that these were human beings that were being seized and enslaved. Peter Fanel was able to amass a massive fortune. He leaves a legacy of a hall that still stands to this day that we now call the Cradle of Liberty. Long after Fanel's time, it would become a hall for revolutionary meetings, abolitionist meetings, suffragist meetings, labor activism, it's still used to this day. But the true legacy of Peter Fanel is way more complicated than just a man who was a merchant who also dealt in enslavement, both directly and indirectly. From the rum that he, that he sold and enjoyed to this mysterious boy we still do not know of, who very well worked in his household, wore livery in his fine sleigh trimmed with bear skin and beaver pelt. On one hand, you have Peter Fanel, but on the other, the true legacy also lies with that unknown boy and this entire empire behind it. I'd like to thank the following people on our final slide for their devotion of time, talent, and resources. Uh, this was a truly a team effort to put this whole thing together. Um, not just my fellow park rangers here, uh, but I really wanna give a shout out to Max Bouchard, who's been a volunteer and intern with us. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job doing research, transcribing. Um, he, it, it's thanks to him that a lot of what we know was able to come together. The Baker Library at Harvard University, uh, just by making these scans digitized and freely available, um, it really made this research pop, uh, possible. 
the folks at NEHGS. And I also want to thank uh, contact uh, through a, a really great colleague of mine uh, to some professors of French in France uh, to help us with some of the letters that Peter uh, wrote uh, to France, to Il Royale, to Saint-Domingue, uh, to help us get a little bit more of an idea about what truly is going on behind this, this empire. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you so much, Eric. Um, you've given us a lot of really great information to unpack, um, and we already have a lengthy list of questions to ask. So I wanna get us started on the Q&A portion of our evening. Um, just a friendly reminder, if you do have questions, please feel free to drop, drop them in the Q&A section. Um, you can add them to the chat as well. My colleague, Sean and I are gonna be monitoring those questions so that we can bring as many of them to Eric's attention as possible. Um, so with that being said, we're going to start off with a snappy question. Where were the ships that Fe Peter Faneuil relied on built, Eric? Uh, so he, one of the major exports that he specializes in is, is coordinating the construction of ships in Boston, in Newburyport, uh, Marblehead, Salem, basically Essex County and Boston. Uh, he coordinates with shipbuilders, shipmasters um, to build ships for either himself, his contacts, family members. Um, and we have two specific examples of him building a ship for a man named Thomas Quay in Jamaica. Uh, and then Lane and Smethurst, uh, it, probably on a regular basis, we just have documentation of one or two, regularly building ships for captains that are sent to him by Lane and Smethurst. So he's building ships for these captains and then he gets a cut of the profits on those initial voyages. Um, so a lot of the ships he's dealing with, they're all registered and from and built in New England. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've received a couple questions surrounding the lack of documentation about Peter Faneuil. Um, people are interested in knowing how someone who's so prominently placed in Boston's history can have that lack of documentation. Um, wondering, are there documents such as household inventories, um, perhaps Peter Faneuil's will, that can give more insight into who he might have possessed and enslaved? Uh, so there is an inventory. Um, and again, much like how the shipping manifests consider enslaved Africans as another commodity, another part of the cargo manifest, in the inventory, it just says that they were, quote, five Negroes. And there was a valuation for each one. Um, if I remember correctly, he dies in test date. So there is no will but there is an inventory. Um, Benjamin, his brother, becomes essentially uh, the man that manages his estate and his affairs. Um, but uh, uh, John Jones actually marries his, his sister, Mary Ann. Uh, Peter never, never married, um, hence the, the ship named Jolly, the Jolly Bachelor. Um, Mary Ann served as essentially the, um, the woman of the household, the, the host of the household. Um, and then right after Peter dies, uh, she marries John Jones, um, and he lives in the, in the mansion. Um, I don't know how these letter books survive. Clearly, this was a volume of many, 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 and they've just disappeared. Maybe they were destroyed. Maybe they were lost. I mean, they're actually part of the uh, Hancock papers at the Baker Library. So how did they even come into the, the ownership or they get mixed in with the, the, the Hancock collection? It, it, not even entirely clear. Um, but for someone who is so wealthy, so significant, um, and so emblematic of this period, there's very little, yet at the same time, even having 160 pages of letters and some ledgers, that's a lot more than you get with a lot of research, especially if you're researching anyone who is lower income of African, American Indian descent, a woman. So on one hand, we're, we're, we shouldn't be too <laughs> too angry because at least we have these pieces and they're critical because it enabled us to go, okay, well, who's this Joshua Boutin? And then with modern uh, databases, we can search the name in newspapers. We can search the name in slave voyage databases. Uh, and so we can do a lot more analytical research and data analysis that you couldn't do even 30 years ago. So we're able to kind of make the existing surviving uh, uh, primary sources go farther, but it takes a lot of legwork and a lot of teamwork. Great. 
Um, moving along, we have a participant wondering the extent to which Peter Faneuil's pursuits are in search of in search of personal wealth are actually tied to a religious sense of goodness or redemption. Um, and if that religious goodness or piety are an issue, how does enslavement of people play into that? Ooh, that's a good question. Because the letters are very business related, um, we don't get a lot of sense about his philosophy. However, after researching him extensively, and knowing that while his ancestors were um, Huguenot, so they are essentially um, Calvinist leaning Protestants, which is why they, they fit in pretty well with uh, colonial Boston is because uh, the, the dominant religion of, of congregationalism is Calvinism. The Huguenots, basically the same kind of theology, same kind of uh, teaching of Calvin. But Peter Fannell goes to the Anglican King's Chapel he is a massive donor and supporter of that church. And I suspect he's a fan of it because it's so lavish. If you go into say Old South Meeting House, it's a very Spartan basic meeting house. You go up the streets of King's Chapel and you can tell even though it, it's not um, supported by a, a phenomenally wealthy uh, mogul of the Atlantic empire. I mean, th these pews were decked out in, in fine um, velvet cushions, trinkets. Um, and in fact, he made a pledge to donate to, the, to King's Chapel um, before he died. And then after he died, his brother was not so interested in keeping that promise. And there was actually a lawsuit over it. And it was thrown out uh, because the, the, the court had no standing in this because it was just a promise to make a donation. Um, and so to me, the and this is my own kind of feeling after reading and, and studying him for so long. I think he's more in it for the money in the show. Um, but again, that's only based off financial dealings um, and his willingness to be quite showy with the money. Um, and so if anything, I think the background in Calvinism perhaps gives him that sense that if he is of the elect, things are good. Um, I'm taking what I've got, what I inherited, and I'm going to make it bigger and better. Um, it's probably a pretty pessimistic view, but after researching him, that's kind of the default I take with, with Peter Fanel. So I hope that answers it sufficiently. So I think related to that to that question and being showy with uh, your money, um, we have a question, a couple of questions about what the attitude in Merchant Boston in the 1700s was in relation to the slave trade, how pervasive that was throughout Merchant Boston. Um, and, and connected to that, are these slave traders trying to hide or obscure their activities? Could that be why it's not in, in the records as much? So in Boston, as Sean introduced, enslavement begins almost immediately after the establishment of the English colony itself, and it persists. Uh, it slowly becomes more codified and entrenched um, as uh, it eventually becomes uh, hereditary. It becomes sanctioned by law. Uh, there is a there's a bit of a public discussion about the uh, how Christian it is to hold slaves uh, in the in 1700 uh, surrounding a man named Adam Saffin. Um, Saffin sues for his freedom. Uh, there's a pamphlet war going back and forth over the morality or the rights of property. Um, it just kind of stops. And by the 1720s, 30s, 40s, so as Peter Fandel is literally coming of age, Boston experiences astronomic growth. To f and, and with more money, more financial growth, it becomes quite fashionable to be able to purchase someone who's enslaved, of African, possibly also American Indian ancestry, uh, to be household help, to be a servant, to be in livery for your carriage. Um, and, and, by, and it reaches the peak in the 1740s such that when Boston's at its peak population, 10% of that roughly 16,000 are people of African or American Indian ancestry, largely overwhelmingly enslaved. Um, and then after Peter Fannel dies, Boston is no longer top dog. Philadelphia, New York overtake it. Um, Boston kind of hits a ceiling with growth 
And what happens, basically people start liquidating their assets to pay off debts when they can't find enough work or income. And, and that actually means, and if you follow the population of people of, of color in Boston, it dips. Um, some of it might be manumission, and we have some examples of manumission, uh, you know, granting freedom or, or individuals gaining their own freedom or seeking freedom by running away. But a lot of the time, in, enslaved people are sent south and they're sold to a bidder and they're sent in ones and twos on coasting ships where there's a little extra space. And so someone buys passage uh, so that this captain can sell someone at an advantage. Um, and, in, you know, Peter Fannel, when he dies, okay, his estate has five uh, enslaved people listed in his uh, inventory, um, but a family completely opposite of the spectrum, a uh, George Robert 12 Hughes, uh, this is a man that throughout his life never saw financial success, was always poor, but when he was young, before his parents died in 1740, 42, um, he remembers going to the docks of Boston so his mother could buy an African girl so they could enslave her and use her as a servant in their household. So at one point, even modest families strove to purchase enslaved people as help around the house and a status symbol. And then once the money got tight, these people were literally liquidated. Um, and so the records, because it comes in piecemeal, because um, we don't have a lot of invoices, um, because the customs records from the Naval Office in Boston they just don't exist from roughly early 1730 to early 1750. So the key period of Peter Fannell's time, we have no custom records uh, in, in, the, in the records office in the UK that survive. Um, and so it's a combination of bad luck with records management um, and the fact that this is just so commonplace, so matter of fact, and it'd be like expecting someone, as brutal as it sound, expecting someone to keep a receipt for buying milk. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's not that cheap, but it was that commonplace to deal in enslaved people. And so you have these transfers happening privately, even advertisements, they would say, well, if you're interested, inquire of the printer where to go. Um, these were always word of mouth, one-on-one -on -one private transactions. Uh, and when ships did arrive directly from Africa or Antigua, um, usually it was a smaller number um, because again, the demand wouldn't be able to handle say 300 enslaved Africans being landed in Boston. Um, so you have 20, 30, five. Um, and one person that does have advertisements for years after Fanel's death offering um, enslaved Africans for sale is John Jones, his posthumous brother-in-law. All right. I think you've already started to touch on this um, in terms of talking about how common enslavement is in the colonies at this point. But can you give people a sense of where Peter Faneuil kind of ranks in terms of slave traders and how maybe a percentage or so of colonists who would have been directly involved with this? So as I alluded to um, earlier, the, the ships that came from Newport or Boston that went to Sierra Leone, uh, they're typically schooners or uh, brigantines. Uh, typically that meant they could carry um, around 80 to 150 kidnapped and enslaved Africans. Ships from say Bristol um, could carry hundreds of enslaved Africans. Uh, and one scholar that I, uh, I, I read who studied the triangular trade, specifically from the perspective of Newport, Rhode Island, um, the New England ships, because they were smaller, um, had kind of an advantage in the sense that they were faster and they could move to islands where the demand was more quickly than, say, these hulking ships that once they landed, they were kind of stuck there trying to sell their stock. Um, and so if you're doing like an apples to apples, 95% of the some 12.5 million enslaved Africans um, that have been estimated to be forcibly imported from the late 1400s to the late 1800s. 12.5 million roughly enslaved Africans forcibly uh, exported, kidnapped, brought to the Caribbean and South America. 95% are, 
are in South America, the Caribbean. Only 5% end up in North America. But um, if you're making cookies, where did that sugar come from? If you're making gingerbread, where did that molasses come from? If you're sending a ship to England to buy manufactured goods, a critical store is rum to keep that water supply clean. And also because the crew demands it uh, in a very unhealthy way to just not care about the horrible conditions of seafaring in the North Atlantic. That rum came from molasses. That molasses came from a sugarcane field. That sugarcane field was tended to, harvested and processed by enslaved labor. Uh, and so it becomes that entrenched uh, uh, in the Atlantic world. So you might deal with somebody that they only, sell, they only traded fish, they only traded molasses, but where's that fish going? Who's that feeding? And who made that molasses? Uh, and so that's where it gets a lot stickier. The, North America becomes kind of the, the, the depot of food, of supplies, of shipping to then bring things from point A to point B. And if it's in, in some parts, and sometimes it's directly individual human beings, other times it's the direct products that will feed or were the stolen labors of enslaved Africans. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we have one more time, time for about one more question. So um, I wanna wrap us up. We've had a couple people bring up the proposed name change to Faneuil Hall um, and people are just wondering um, perhaps maybe where the city, the Park Service stands on this. Are there alternative names that have been suggested and how is that playing into the city today? So um, in the recent years, activists have called for the renaming of a hall because it's named after Peter Fannell. And as we've established, he has a very complicated, very hurtful legacy. Um, the hall was donated to Boston. As a, you know, Peter Fennell left it as a legacy to the people. Uh, a fire gutted it in 1762 or 61. It was expanded in 1805 and 1806 to roughly what you see today. Um, and it's been maintained by the town and then city, the people of Boston ever since. Uh, so it's, it's really the city's hall. Um, and, you know, who you commemorate, who you remember, what you name, um, it's really up to the community that has the most claim to it, I, I think. They're, they're the ones that have the ability to determine what the name could be. Um, you know, it's an ongoing debate. And what we wanna do is provide the context, provide the information. Um, you know, people have asked different, um, people have proposed different names, um, I couldn't begin to think personally of which ones I could select. Um, did that answer the question? I, it, my internet hiccup for a split second when you asked it, so. Yeah, I think that answered the question. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, I know that we have not had time to get to all of the questions that have been dropped in both the chat and the Q&A section. Um, I do wanna remind everyone, if you have questions that are still unanswered, um, please feel free to email us. We would be happy to respond to you. Um, my colleague has just dropped the email address in the chat. So please reach out with any of those unanswered questions you, you might still have. Um, at this point, I want to pass it off to Rebecca Smerling, who is the Director of Programs for Boston Harbor Now, uh, so that she can close us out. Hi. Thank you so much, um, Eric um, and Sean. I really, I feel like I can speak for all of us that we really feel truly um, honored to have been part of this, um, this presentation and all of your incredible research and um, sharing this very different story that many of us probably have never heard this evening. Um, I wanna remind people, this is part of our, um, our series, Revolutionary Harbor. Um, in a normal year, we would probably be in a, um, in a space together on the waterfront um, where we want to tell the stories of the waterfront year round. Um, as we know, we are in a different space, um, but it's, it's wonderful to welcome everyone here in this virtual space um, 
think I took note that we had 17 states represented in two countries and over 35 communities from across Massachusetts. So I am so delighted that you're all here with us. Uh, we look forward to welcome you again to, to future programs um, uh, in partnership with the National Park Service and our partners at the Department of Conservation and Recreation and Boston Harbor now. Um, we have uh, and we have some upcoming um, lectures in March. Um, we have the Voyage of Mercy, um, which will be on March 9th, and then later on, two other Revolutionary Harbor series. So look at our website, follow us. Um, I also welcome everyone to come to the harbor, um, come down to see Faneuil Hall, come see the Middle Passage marker down at Long Wharf. Um, and thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>